Chinese railway engineers are literally having to come up with new tunnel cold resistance building techniques for rail and bridge materials to build the 5,000 kilometers of high-speed rail on the Tibetan Plateau by 2035. They will build all the way to Nepal, crossing the Himalayas. 98.5% of the connection will either be through bridges or tunnels, turning it into a land-linked country and reducing its heavy dependence on India. They haven't missed a single deadline or target yet. The topography is probably the most hostile terrain to human habitation outside of the Arctic and dry desert regions of the world. The Nepal project was unthinkable in the past, but Chinese engineers gained a lot of experience and knowledge about cold temperature environments while building the Xinjiang Connection, a desert area in China, since deserts can be frigid at night. As well, they got an immense amount of experience with mountainous terrains in Yunnan. This province now has an insane amount of bridges, and they have set even more aggressive targets. By 2025, the total scale of the railway in Nepal will reach about 4,000 kilometers. By 2035, the total scale of the railway network of Nepal will reach more than 5,000 kilometers, connecting neighboring provinces and regions with major land ports along the border. The network covers a wide range of transportation, convenient travel, and sufficient capacity. The modern railway network will support and lead the economic and social development of the region. Besides their work on Nepal, China plans to double the size of their rail network by 2035. West China and the Rust Belt Northeast will be the big beneficiaries. The speed of development is quite impressive. In 2008, during the Beijing Olympics, China's high-speed rail network was considerably more modest, consisting of a 19-mile maglev train from Shanghai Airport to the outskirts of Shanghai and a traditional high-speed rail line from Beijing to the coastal city of Tianjin. Today, China's high-speed rail network has expanded exponentially, with 8 times more high-speed rail than France, 10 times more than Japan, 20 times more than the UK, and a staggering 500 times more than the US. In fact, China now possesses as much high-speed rail track as the rest of the world combined, demonstrating remarkable progress in a relatively short time. It's worth noting that traditional high-speed rail systems are typically found in smaller, wealthier countries like Germany, France, and Japan. China, on the other hand, is neither small nor extremely affluent. The country is vast, approximately the same size as the US, and while it is no longer considered poor, it falls within the category of middle-income countries, comparable in economic status to Mexico, Thailand, or Brazil. Remarkably, China, despite being the country with the most extensive high-speed rail network globally, is also the least affluent to possess such a system. China's large population and considerable population density, especially in the eastern half of the country, provide a foundation for high-speed rail success. The proximity of major cities in China makes train travel a sensible choice over air travel, even on relatively short routes. What's more, the high-speed train is often more cost-effective than flying, making it a practical choice for many travelers in China, even on longer routes where it might not be economically viable in other countries. Take Beijing and Shanghai, for instance. They are approximately 650 miles apart, a distance that would typically render high-speed rail impractical. In comparison, Paris and Barcelona are closer at 500 miles, yet only two high-speed trains run between them daily, while there are about 20 flights. For the Beijing-Shanghai route, however, there are approximately 50 flights versus 41 trains. Despite the fact that trains carry significantly more passengers, up to 1,200, they remain the dominant mode of transportation between these two major Chinese cities. Several factors differentiate these two routes. Firstly, the Beijing-Shanghai train journey takes four and a half hours, while the shorter Paris-Barcelona trip takes six hours. Moreover, the competitive landscape plays a significant role. In Europe, there is an efficient air transport network largely dominated by budget airlines that often offer more affordable fares than trains. Air travel within China also faces challenges in terms of efficiency. The three largest Chinese airlines, China Southern, China Eastern, and Air China, have on-time arrival rates of 70%, 66%, and 63% respectively. This is partly due to limited airspace available for civilian flights, as most of China's airspace is controlled by the military, leaving only narrow corridors for civilian planes to operate in, covering just 30% of the airspace. 
The resulting congestion leads to frequent air traffic control delays, contributing to the poor on-time performance of the country's airlines. Despite the shorter two-hour flight duration between Beijing and Shanghai, the potential for delays and other factors affecting air travel make the train the preferred choice for this longer route. However, some high-speed train routes in China are less economically viable. For example, the Lanzhou Urumqi high-speed train takes 11 hours, compared to the two-and-a-half-hour flight. The construction cost for this rail line was $20 billion, and even if every seat on every train were filled, tickets would need to cost $400 each way to recoup the construction cost within 30 years. In reality, ticket prices are around $90, and trains are often not fully occupied, making this rail line far from profitable. The ticket revenues from these planes reportedly do not even cover the cost of electricity for the line, let alone construction and other operating expenses. So, why would the Chinese government invest such substantial sums into a project that appears to lack any real prospects of financial viability? Politics plays a significant role in the development of high-speed rail in China. Urumqi, the capital of the Xinjiang province, has a predominantly Uyghur population, one of China's minority ethnic groups, and has witnessed a strong separatist movement, at times escalating into violence. The central government in Beijing aims to integrate Xinjiang with the rest of the country and has employed various measures to achieve this, including relocating Han Chinese to the region. The construction of the high-speed train line is an effort openly acknowledged by the government as a means to promote ethnic unity. This strategy is not unique. Tibet, another region known for its independence movement, was the last area in China to lack a railway due to its small population and challenging terrain. Nonetheless, the central government constructed a railway connecting Beijing to the rest of the country as we described at the beginning of the video. Like any country, China's efficient high-speed rail network is bringing the nation closer together and strengthening it. China is constructing its high-speed rail network with remarkable efficiency, setting it apart from most other countries. For comparison, consider California's high-speed rail project from San Francisco to the Los Angeles area, which is still in the early construction phases and expected to open by 2029. However, the cost is projected to be $77 billion for a 520-mile network, equating to $148 million per mile. In contrast, China is building its network at the cost of only $30 million per mile. This discrepancy is influenced by lower labor costs in China and the network's passage through more rural areas with lower land acquisition expenses. More importantly, China has turned high-speed rail construction into an almost assembly line process, enabling mass production of even the most expensive components such as viaducts and tunnels. With their characteristic scale, China is making high-speed rail more cost-effective. The key distinction between China and many Western countries such as the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK is that high-speed rail is a top priority for the Chinese government. Notably, China has prioritized social benefits as defined by the central government over profitability in the development of its high-speed rail network. High-speed rail lines are not as financially lucrative as other modes of transport like airplanes, but they offer clear advantages to a country when considering overall profitability. The China Railway Corporation, a state-owned enterprise, is indeed somewhat profitable, although it carries substantial debt and benefits from government subsidies. However, the benefits to the Chinese population are substantial. High-speed rail enables people who cannot afford to live in expensive cities like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou to easily commute from more affordable suburbs using high-speed rail. Thanks to the high-speed rail, 75 million people can now commute to Shanghai in under an hour, fueling the growth of already massive cities. In the realm of cities, size often equates to strength. China stands out as the first country to experiment with long-distance high-speed rail through less densely populated areas in its western regions. In the east, however, these trains are bolstering the country's economic power, contributing to China's rapid catch-up with the world's wealthiest nations. While China's ability to construct high-speed rail more cost-effectively and innovate in construction techniques plays a role, the fundamental reason for its success is the political will to prioritize high-speed trains, which many other countries lack.